I would love to invite my hopefully less sweaty uh, panel up onto um, up on stage. Um, so, in order of appearance, <laughs> uh, we have Alice Breeden, uh, who was running the uh, people functions for Google um, globally and is now at uh, Hydric, representing the people part of the equation. Um, Mark Lien, who is running the uh, machine intelligence program at uh, Lloyds Bank and is trying to put this whole process in place um, for Lloyds. Um, and Sophie Richardson, who um, is from Microsoft and heads up the AI and data um, team at Microsoft, helping uh, large clients work through these kinds of issues. Um, thank you. Water, even cold. I could do it with a towel as well. <laughs> huh. um, so this is us. Can everyone still hear us? OK, well, we're going to test whether you can hear everyone. Why don't we start with Sophie? Would you just introduce yourself briefly? I think you can take the headphones off now. If, as long as you can hear me. Can you hear me? OK. Um, I will shout. Um, so why don't we come this way? And Sophie, tell us a little bit about what you do at Microsoft and um, any thoughts on that? Right. So yes, yeah, Sophie Richardson. And then I head up our data and AI team um, within Microsoft's customer success unit. Um, at Microsoft, our customer success unit started up um, last July. Um, and it was an acknowledgement really about the fact that many customers may look to adopt technology in their organizations. They may deploy an initial project with that technology, but then what do they do after that with that same technology? Um, so my team's main purpose is to help them really understand uh, the benefits of that technology, help them adopt it, provide knowledge transfer and skills um, to help customers essentially be successful in what they've invested in. Fantastic, thank you. And um, Alice Breeden is next. So Alice. Um we talked a lot about people, about attracting and retaining and exciting, maybe even branding our people. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about your perspective on this from Google and now with, uh, now with Hydric. All right, yeah. so good to see everyone. I don't think I've ever been quite so hot <laughs> sitting on a panel. Um, so I try not to sweat through this. Uh, so I was at McKinsey for about 12 years where I first met Chris, um, doing organizational change. So ever, uh, my personal passion is around transformational change how to lead organizations uh, in terms of people and leadership and talent, some of the things that Chris touched on in, the, in his P. Um, and then I joined Google, where I was director of people operations for Google EMEA for three years. Um, and after that, joined Hydric, where I'm now back in the consulting world, uh, trying to help clients um, be more effective uh, in digital transformation and other types of change. Um, so I find I bring perspectives from the consulting side, which is often large, old organizations like hospitals or banks or airlines who are trying to become digital and from the Google kind of pure play digital world. Um, and at Google, um, I think the things that I've taken from their three years at Google fit into kind of consulting is um, you know, a strong focus on how you find your people, how you grow your people, and how you keep your people. And I think Google is very good at, um, particularly in a very heated you know, software engineer market, focusing a lot of attention on recruitment. Uh, 2,000 in-house recruiters, never let it go out of house, no external search firms are used. Um, you know, investing in education, investing in schools, girls who can, you know, really getting the pipeline of people into that recruitment element. And on the grow side, given, I don't know, the growth of the organization and the change of what it does over each year, enabling Googlers to teach each other. So on the grow side, how do you create a network of learning in these kinds of organizations where things are changing so fast? And then on the keep side, clearly with Google, um, the kind of ability to have a, an overall value proposition for an employee that's clearly well-funded. Uh, in Google's case and lots of tech companies' case, not always, but alongside that thinking, what is it that we need to tell our people? What's our story? What's our purpose? What's our mission? What's our total uh, value proposition to our employees, which you talked a little bit about too. So I try and keep those things with me now when talking to older organizations when they're trying to become digital, and, you know, recruit a digital officer and think about what, you know, what did Google do? Not all of it's useful, but some of it, I think, could, be, could still resonate. And so, Mark, as we, as we all know from the Lloyd's TV advertising, Lloyd's We're was old. 250 <laughs> years old when, uh, when Google was created in a garage somewhere on the West Coast. Um, you know, how are you thinking about bringing these kinds of technology to bear at scale in, in such a, you know, forget legacy from the 90s. I mean, we've got legacy from the sort of 1780s or something. <laughs> how does that work? Um, so just checking you can hear me OK? Yeah, good. So, I Actually, reflecting on your uh, presentation, Chris, I think what we're trying to do is deliver AI at scale in the enterprise. So a little bit, our story is quite similar to Quantum Black, but inside mm. rather than outside. So a lot of the things that you said resonate. Um, do any of you, just raise your hand if you have a product or bank with Lloyds or Halifax or Bank of Scotland or MBNA or Scottish Widows? So about somewhere between a third and a half of the population in the UK 
have a product with Lloyds Banking Group. And so one of the things that excites me is that if we actually get, um, if we actually get this right, we can affect a lot of people, a lot of our colleagues. We've got 65,000 plus colleagues and 30 million customers. And that's actually quite an exciting thing as a, a way to have impact quickly at scale. Now we're on a bit of a journey here. We have uh, some legacy challenges to overcome. I'm sure we'll get into a bit as well. Um, but we are committed and right at the heart of our strategy is um, upgrading our IT and our data and our AI and ML infrastructure to allow the diffusion of these technologies everywhere across the bank, not and just doing in a couple of pockets. How are you making those choices? Like that's a you know, multi-million or sort of dozens of millions of um, pounds question. Um, how, how are you thinking about this? So well, the first thing is value back, as you say. So I think if you take, um, the opportunities are so large. If you can unshackle the organization from some of the constraints people operate today with in terms of processes, data, and actually help them reimagine a new world. There are hundreds of millions of pounds of opportunity for the business and massive customer experience improvement everywhere. So we typically take an approach where we find our first use case. And the benefit of being the first use case is your first. The downside is you have to pay the infrastructure tax to go and build the enabler that will allow everybody else to be second, third, fourth, fifth, and so on. And the benefit of being six is uh, second or third or fourth fist is that you get it for very cheap and you can deploy quickly, except you have to wait. That's the first thing. The second thing is we try and decouple our you know, legacy architecture and infrastructure from this very rapidly changing, very fast paced external R&D environment that allows us to plug and play as best of market, best of breed shifts around. And that means we've got very few decisions which are committing the bank for five years. Um, we've actually got opportunities of keeping up with the market. Do, do they believe you and how do you, how do you make them believe you? So there are many, there are many use cases, um, not all of them customer facing. There are many uh, back-end uh, middle office processes which, Frank, the way we think about it is if you take the top 20 people in the bank and you ask them to rank order the five most important problems they each have, you could answer and look at each of one of those problems through a data science or machine learning lens and they're all multi-hundred million pound opportunities. The way we went from sort of PowerPoint to belief is actually show, don't tell. Um, it can cost a lot to go and do the data infrastructure and all the wiring, but we have a sort of two data scientists and a whippet model. We're literally with two data scientists and a, you know, a notional do you whippet. Have a, do you have an office door? We have lots of whippets. <laughs> um, uh, we can actually go and prove value, not prove concepts, but identify line of sight to new value in the organization within six weeks. And at that point, it's much easier to build momentum for um, sort of industrial or you know, piloting and industrialization. And Sophie, you um, you help a lot of uh, clients and people work through these uh, decisions and kind of routes to landing the value from this. W what have you seen work well, or, or where, where have people struggled as they as they try to uh, do this and deploy these technologies? Yeah. Something I guess. Um I probably can't say that anybody's absolutely nailed it that I've come across yet, um, but we can probably share some themes of things um, that probably we've observed. So I'll probably put it into four categories, really. I think, firstly, culture. Um, I think when you get the culture right in the organisation, um, top down within the business, to have the desire to change and have the right people in the organisation that want to change and take calculated risks and push forwards, I think that's had a huge impact in some of the customers that certainly um, I've seen. Um, the second one would be around collaboration. So I think where you've got the business doing one thing and IT doing the other, um, in an AI world, I don't think that's ever going to work. So the collaboration between those business units, I think in an AI area for our customers has been, you know, it has to be there, I think, to be successful. Um, and where we've seen it work well as Microsoft is where those two organizations do work together. I think probably the um, third thing I'd say is around people um, and the skill sets and readiness of those people. So. Um, some of our customers have been on a journey where they're bringing in new types of roles into their business, you know, roles that they never thought they would have to have before. So people who maybe deal in psychology or sociology who actually could understand how to deploy AI in an ethical way, okay, because they haven't had those types of roles in their organization to date. Um, and I think probably fourthly is around governance, and you mentioned that a lot earlier. Um, really understanding the strict protocols and the practices that you have to have in place and making sure that the business and IT are both sort of abiding by them so you're both on the same page. And so. it's, uh, it's interesting you mentioned sort of how do we get 
there's IT in one place and like the business in another place. Alice, I'm guessing that at Google you would never have like a digital meeting, right? Or sort of you know, where where did IT no sit word. at Google, right? So, any thoughts on how do you get beyond that sort of we're over here and we're the business and those people are over there and their IT to like an Amazon or a Google or a sort of somewhere where people don't talk about oh that's a digital meeting or like those guys work in IT or whatever. It's a good question, and I think. Um you know, being in Google, where uh, you know, I was very aware going from McKinsey to Google that the kind of pure play tech world is just so different from anything else. Um, and I, I typically counsel my current clients, who are insurance companies and banks in the UK, that they don't want to be a Google. You know, pure play Google is not is not like normal. You know, because most companies have not been set up like that really. So most of my clients are trying to become, you know, digital in their whole organisation, their whole culture. You know, living and breathing it like you're achieving in Lloyd's. And I think it's a journey. I think there's a kind of there's a sort of set of steps in, uh, along the way where, you know, typically companies kind of pull out the digital thing and they have digital meetings and digital themes, and they might appoint a CDO, chief, chief digital officer, who then has to grow and build and kind of, you know, well, you were describing this at lunch, you know, has to kind of kick against the traces of everything that's happening and change the recruitment, change the way everything's done, and then that has to go on for a couple of years, depending on how quickly you can get it done, and then you would it become part of the fabric of the organization and then you cannot have a thematic group. But I guess the other thing I would say is having done a lot of work in change over many, many, far too many years, um, it's not an uncommon pattern, you know, trying to really transform an organization. So first of all, you have to, you know, incubate it and draw attention to it and put a leader in place um, who's going to really, you know, make it a thing. And, that, and then uh, over time, that becomes more the fabric of the organization and you forget what all the fuss is about and it just sort of embeds. So, Although I know we are living in very exciting times, I think there has been a lot of change over some the of last... These, some of these things are eternal. <laughs> many hundred of years of work. You know. I was just going to pick up on both what, um, uh, what Sophie and uh, Anna said, because if, if I reflect on what I've observed at Lloyd's, there are two divisions which can't exist in this world that we're now talking about. The first is between business and IT, because your, the way you run your business is now dynamic systems that are inherently technology-driven, and so you can't have there's some pointy-headed person in the corner, which is different from the pointy-headed people over here that deal with commercial. You actually need your village uh, analogy, um, but across the patch. And the second is a division I've seen in some places between, w this is the organization that does change, and when they've done change, they hand it over to a different bunch of people that do and run. These other people get changed. They get changed, <laughs> and it's like, again, because of the nature of uh, machine learning systems and networks, it takes as long to retrain the model as to build in the first place, so you have, there's no difference between run and change. And so a lot of the transformation we're seeing is not actually, it's not the AI or the ML bit, we need to get the infrastructure right, we will. It's actually a people transformation, yeah. first and foremost, because success isn't I've now got a better algorithm. Success is that this is now adopted as a new way of running your business, and that is now affecting better customer outcomes, not I've now got a better algorithm that no one's using, um, which is a risk of if you don't address some of these organizational challenges at the same time. And as I look around, we have a lot of people in the audience who are leading organizations, leading teams. Um, a large part of this, it feels from what you guys are saying, is that this is as much a leadership challenge as, um, as anything else. Um, how is it different being a leader in this world of trying to do AI at scale to being a leader in, let's say, a, a legacy world? Maybe Alice sort of kick us off and then Sophie Mark, if you want to jump in. Well, we do a lot of work with leaders, uh, especially in the digital, digital, <laughs> digital transformation space. Um, and I think typically we're talking about leading through complexity and, you know, almost chaos sometimes. Uh, and I think some of the skills that that requires is not, not to see change as a kind of waterfall diagram, as you've alluded to, or a thing that gets done and then given, which was, it was also ever thus. But, you know, I think increasingly that's very outdated. So we talk about um, having to, you know, um, try lots of things at the edges, so lots of experimentation, getting feedback um, very quickly, sort of system thinking, but applied to organizational change. So doing lots of things in lots of different places, getting feedback very quickly, uh, being very agile, being very, uh, you know, able to change course very quickly. These leadership capabilities around agility, failing fast, I mean, these are probably words and things you're very used to, but we're trying to, you know, enable leaders who haven't actually been rewarded or incentivized to do that sort of thing. You know, you're actually need to have a waterfall you know, chart that says you're going to deliver this change by this time. Um, and trying to get organizations to be comfortable with having very big ambitions. You know, we want to create a huge goal that is going to inspire and excite. And I've got no idea how we're going to get there. We're going to try like 20 things and half of them won't work. 
it's not a very you know normal conversation. So trying to build um, le those sorts of leadership capabilities that are on that side, um, and assuming that leaders have a basic ability to kind of mobilise and execute and get stuff done, and performance management, consequence management, which are all still good skills that we everyone do. Has to do all of the, everyone has to do all of the good <laughs> stuff as well. Right? Yeah, <laughs> but the agility piece, we talk about mobilise, execute, transform with agility as our mm. the way we talk about leadership. And increasingly, we're having to work with leaders on the agility piece because yeah. uh, it's not, not an easy thing to, to do. And so. Sophie, yeah. across the organisations you worked with, like any a bit black and shining white. examples? <laughs> or I think accountability is a big leadership principle, I think, um, that people, I've observed, spreading that across their organisation, I think people feel empowered um, to be able to make the change, you know, to learn from it, and actually I think that accountability plays a big piece there. So part of that, I think, of the, the organisation I've observed is they're embedding that into people's core behaviours and core priorities as an organisation. So top down, what do we want to exist as, as a mission, as an organisation, and actually making people accountable through their performance reviews and their day-to-day -day priorities to actually deliver that. And I think that's one of the ways that some customers that we've seen have been able to change the culture, um, help drive the right mindset of people uh, within the organisation and actually scale that best practice a lot quicker. And one of the sort of um, like carved in stone truths about innovation is this, this concept about being increasingly comfortable with failure. Um, and often that, um, I'm trying to not do a horrible metaphor here, but like that sort of ship of innovation founders on the rocks of like people reviews, right? You know, yeah, it's great to talk about being comfortable with failure until you do something and it really doesn't work and you mess it up and then you have your review, right? Um, like, Mark, as you're trying to scale these teams through Lloyd's, maybe this is an unfair question, but what have you failed at recently and how did that go? And um, you know, how, do you, how, do you, how do you deal with it? <laughs> yeah, so I think, um, I think it evolves. I mean, the stage is called Lab to Live and there's definitely a, a phase where you need to move from, I've got a little island that's doing some innovation where I've actually got some production examples where that's true. And in your first production examples, you need leaders who are willing to go through the journey where sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. And if you reframe failure to learning, it's not such a scary thing and such a bad thing. Um, however, as you get to live, people are running businesses. We've got 30 million customers that can be affected. And so failure actually has consequences and we've got regulators and so on. So the nature of the test and learn becomes comes different. It's sort of, yeah, tell that to the customers of whichever bank it was recently, the, the core IT system TSP. went down. It's like, hey, we were just experimenting, right? Yeah. It's good to fail, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we've got some obligations we need to meet. The thing, that, the thing I think that's missing, so Lab to Live is good, and I feel like you know, we're in a position we're alive, but the bigger challenge is from live to live at scale. So how do I go from 10 production deployments to 150 production deployments? Now, there's a technology aspect to that, but actually the leadership point is the hardest piece because I need to have 150 managing directors around the place that are comfortable and competent to run machine learning driven systems in production and know what they're doing and understand and how to ask the right question. And that's actually as big a challenge as that scale as the technology one. And we, we advertised for a role at Quantum Black recently, which we called Cyborg Trainer. Um, <laughs> and we did it partly just because we thought it sounded fun. But I mean, there's this point about um, we all need to develop these new skills to understand how to run teams that are a mix of humans and algorithms and like automated processes and so on and and how to make our stakeholders whether those are regulators or our board or our bosses or our teams comfortable with that um, that kind of process um, I can't see anyone waving at me which means that we're probably okay on time um, do we have a mechanism for having questions from the audience I think there's a is there an audience participation app is that yeah I can see I can see good thumbs is this is it going to go up on screen, or how can we? Uh, uh. How can? We <laughs> oh, in your in your Cogex booklets, um, there there is a mechanism for doing this. Is it um, Rovio? Is anyone has anyone participated in a question Q and A session so far today? <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I uh, probably should have known this before I got on stage. <laughs> or does anyone feel comfortable shouting a question, and then I'll I'll play it back to the group. Hands. Or is everyone too sweaty to be able to uh, to even ask any questions? So I can share some other examples, Chris, if you want, of oh. things that we've looked at. Sorry? Yeah, I can share some other examples of things we've been doing, if that works. Yeah. Um, just maybe to warm up the audience a bit more. <laughs> so I think some of the um, some of the ways of I think kind of learning fast, to call it rather than I suppose failing fast, um, yeah. that we've been doing with customers recently is around hackathons, and um, not just technology hackathons, but also business hackathons as well. 
Um, so some of our customers have actually, what they've achieved in 48 hours of hacking together has actually been the solution they've taken through into production. So I think we've started to observe actually Microsoft that actually not all projects have to be hugely costly. They don't have to have a very well-defined start set of objectives and an end that actually you can do something very quickly in a very agile way with the right specialists, both technology and business specialists in the room, and probably you'll get to a point where good is good enough and be comfortable with being good is good enough. And a lot of those customers we've done those hacks with have taken that into production. And, what, um, and that, that's just been of, something that's been quite new, I think, for, for me what and kind of things have, um, What kind of things have people hacked together at that kind of uh, Ooh, All speed? sorts. Or I mean, I, I, I would love us to get to a point where AI just isn't about bots, I have to say. <laughs> but I think we're still quite in a place with some of our customers where a bot is considered to be, you know, kind of AI. So that's one of the most common type of hackathons that we would do, um, looking at how um, we can automate uh, people's ab ability to self-serve maybe within their own in kind of internal HR systems, um, whether it's the way they report problems into their organizations that help improve customer service. I probably can't mention customer names here. Um, but these things can be done very, very quickly and they can be done in a, in a multi-cloud strategy as well, hackathon. It doesn't have to be put all of your eggs in one basket. Um, and that just gives people the opportunity to prove the value of the technology very quickly, make a quick decision on which cloud vendor will provide the best technology capability for them as well, and then move forward with that very quickly without very long RFPs. Um, and I think that's part of the kind of the scaling approach that I think comes in from lab to live, actually where you can speeding up that process. Um, so just to, hopefully that's warmed up the audience a bit. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Do we, do we have very anyone good. who wants to shout out a question? Yeah, at the back. Do we? <laughs> You have to go yeah, must have a mic. Oh, I was There's about to do an Annika Rice kind of. Uh, uh, probably no one else in the audience is old enough to remember Annika Rice, but here we go. Hi. Um, okay. Hi. Um, so, so you mentioned Whoa. earlier that on. I'm the one person who can't understand the question, okay. so I am going to run back. Here. <laughs> uh, it's actually a question for you, but for the panel as well. You mentioned earlier that um, one of the reservations you get from companies around implementing these types of solutions is we're just not ready for this. Uh, maybe we can't even do product development well without AI. So how do you overcome that type of challenge, I guess, both from a, a specialist consultancy, but also internally? Um, so how do, we, how do we overcome the sort of, we're not, we're not ready for a challenge? Um, I think the, the black part of um, Quantum Black was always intended to be, we should be like the sort of the black ops um, of, uh, of data and able to kind of parachute in out of a helicopter and kind of find the data and, and build the models and um, sort of make things happen. And I think that, um, you know, Sophie was talking about hackathons and so on. That slightly hacky uh, mentality or ethos is still very much a, a part of how we operate. And I think having some of that mindset is, for us, a really big um, part of how we don't get trapped behind the five-year enterprise data warehouse um, project that, you know, that, that five-year horizon when the data is perfect is always going to be five years away and will, and will never come any closer. Um, and so having something of a hacking mindset to get going um, and to start demonstrating the early value that, that Mark touched on um, is for us a big part of how to break out of that that kind of um, cycle. I mean, Mark, any any thoughts on that? Yeah. I would actually say, in a, in a world of with data science and machine learning, I think it's actually much easier to get to the point of value identification than innovation in other domains, because whilst in production you want to make sure that you've got all of the data pipes right, you've got clean data, that you've got end-to-end -end accountability and controls. To go and do the experimentation, you need to go and you know scrabble together a little bit of data, have a hypothesis, and then have a couple of people with the right skills to go and have a go. And um, that's we've actually found that easier than to do something which is you know in innovation on the you know the digital channel, for example, or you know innovation in some process where you've got to have you know cast of thousands who've all got a perspective. We've been able to do many dozens of experiments in a, you know, in a quarter, and I know half of them went nowhere, but half of them have actually shown real promise and have matured. And that, that's even before anyone anywhere's really got hold of it. That's just um, almost, I feel like part of my team is in an R&D function, which is at very low cost, very low cost, highly geared, um, staying six months ahead of everybody else yeah. to seed ideas to their MDs elsewhere in the bank that really there is something in your business here to look at. So we've actually found it relatively straightforward. To get there, we started with you know, one guy, me and one guy who understood a, a bit of architecture, a bit of data analytics, and a bit of data science. 
and now we've scaled to you know a 30-person data science team, and you know all of the engineering and you know the rest of the village in terms of UX UI that needs to go around it as well. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, I think we still have the roving mic. Any other questions? Here we go. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Let me pop on the headphones. Very interesting new approaches to solving businesses' problems. What does this do to the traditional management consulting companies? I know you're part of McKinsey now, but what does this do to the six, seven thousand McKinsey consultants around the world? So, just for the benefit of my fellow fellow panelists, does everyone? Yeah, does everyone okay, yeah, awesome. Um, so, uh, I think it changes management consulting very uh, very broadly. I'm, I can share a couple of thoughts on this from the from that perspective, and maybe. Um, you guys as, as kind of uh, consumers to some extent of uh, consultancy services can also share a thought. I mean, um, I think for, um, for McKinsey, it's, it's fair to say the, the perspective was that all of these technological changes um, are going to change management consulting um, entirely. And, and that's, I think, you know, a matter of public record. And McKinsey's first kind of technology venture was in 2007, which was the first kind of McKinsey solution. Um, and there are now, I think, about 45 different um, McKinsey solutions, which are specific bits of tech to do different stuff. Um, but I think that what the acquisition of Quantum Black um, for McKinsey was about was about moving beyond a solution in a, in a specific point space, but saying, actually, this is about having to have these capabilities at scale within McKinsey in order to solve contemporary problems. So one of the phrases that's going around at the moment is the new science of problem solving. That management consultancy used to be about um, sort of problem solving per se, using different uh, frameworks and um, sort of industry best practices and so on. And actually, there's a new, uh, newly scientific approach to problem solving that is going to turn consulting um, on its head. And so the acquisition of Quantum Black, our scale up, and other things that McKinsey is doing is. I think reflects their take, and we see a lot of the other traditional consultancies either disappearing or, or transforming rapidly um, at the at the same time. Um, I guess, Mark, you're probably the biggest consumer of uh, consulting so, services here. So I'd say um, that lab to live and live to live at scale is hard, and there are lots of people, you know, at lawyers and everywhere else that um, need comfort that it's the right thing to do and how to do it, and. Putting in place the right, I, mean, I spend as much of my time on setting up the right risk framework and the right control environment so that my data scientists and other people in the bank can operate this stuff safely as I do on technology. And so I think there's traditional consulting, but with deep SME expertise in this domain that will persist. But then um, I think I'm seeing more and more this sort of show don't tell, the, the sort of pure advisory being overtaken by um, proof of value. Um, as being a shift and so consulting firms that haven't got an ability to demonstrate value um, or evidence it are going to struggle because I think we're moving from this is important to here's how to make it work safely. And Alice, some people would say that in terms of consulting, the kind of um, area that Hydric plays in is maybe the most kind of either resistant to, so to speak, or sort of furthest away from technology. Is that totally wrong, or like Resistant how does how does technology and sort of leadership and, and, and sort of organisational consulting kind of come together or not? Uh, I was going to answer the original question. I think that you know all of this world of AI and machine learning, and you know I'm I'm involved in lots of research projects on the future of work. What's going to happen when jobs are automated? And I don't know. All this change is. I feel in my I've been around far too many years probably that you know all of this change essentially is going to be led by people and leaders and cultures and organizations that are going to adopt and transform so I think there's always room I don't particularly want to champion the consulting industry but there's you know these things are difficult to do um, and sometimes you need courage and you need the ability to convince an organization to do it and to do it fast so I think there's always going to be a role for consulting and I guess because I'm at Hydric my my passion has always been the people side of change and uh, of consulting and, and world and getting people engaged and empowered and living the right choices at work every day that mean your organization will do the right things, whatever the question it's facing, whether it's AI or machine learning or something else entirely. So I think there's a huge road ahead. Fantastic. So I think we have time just for a couple more questions. Um, any, I see a hand uh, over there. Um, I've noticed that our three questions so far have come all from men, so I would encourage uh, the women in the audience to put your hands up next, next time. Hi there. One of the... Um problems I, I um, haven't heard spoken about a great deal 
is actually the internal training programs that you put in place to facilitate the transformation. Now, not just the annual one, one hour brief on AI is important to the business, but actually give, giving people the schools, tools and skills that they can move at pace where they can't achieve a certification in six months, they need to do something in a month or weeks. And how does that work for these transformations? It's a, it's a fantastic question. And um, I'm conscious I was moving it around uh, 300 kilometers an hour through the, uh, through the presentation like, a, like an F1 car, um, but less stylish. Um, and the, the final um, I of our, of our five eyes is around independence, which for us is all about capability building. Um, let me maybe share a couple of thoughts and then I'll, I'll ask these guys' thoughts as well. So we, we tend to think of it in terms of um, five populations who all need very different things. So there's the top team in the board who probably just need to be kind of made less scared of the technology and understand how to ask good questions and what good or bad answers look like to those questions. Um, there are the, the sort of business unit leads who are, who are going to be transforming that stuff. The team leads who are going to be really working with the specialists the specialists themselves, the designers, the software engineers, the data scientists, and so on, who often don't need technical training, but often do need kind of presentation training or having difficult conversations training, and so on. So a lot of that soft skills stuff. So all of our technical folks at Quantum Black work with the National Theatre on those kind of skills, for example. Um, and then there's like everyone else. How do you get everyone else in a large organization kind of enthused about that? Um, but I think you're exactly right. Unless you can engage engage all of those different populations, and it's not really in a two two days in a classroom and like tick you're done you know um, kind of way. Um, these these efforts will uh, will flounder. Um, and maybe Mark, do you want to touch a bit on what you're doing in that space, and then Sophie on sort of how you guys back up the yeah. services you offer with training. So maybe I'll add um, to the sort of classroom teaching or digital teaching. Aspect. I'm, I'm a big fan of um, the apprenticeship model to actually learn by doing. And so in addition to sort of the broadcast on a spray painting everybody so that we raise the bar everywhere, where we're actually working with a particular unit at transforming how that work gets done, we, we've got this concept of a model office where we create an environment for a new way of running that bit of the business. So if it's a, a planning team that does forecasting of call center demand, that team turns up in a model office with the data scientists and some agile coaches and, and they live the experience and it's, and it's really important because not only do they live the experience and have all sorts of aha moments, the technical pe teams actually learn as well, but importantly, that they have to run it once it's there. And so, um, you know, training folks that need to run some of these more complex systems by a couple of days of training is quite dangerous. Um, and so actually this model office concept of bringing through people through this sort of transformation engine means that we're upskilling and reskilling a large body of the, of the bank at the same time as we go through our journey. Sophie, how do you um, help the organizations that you're working with as you're bringing AI and data and machine learning to the table to kind of build those skills? How do you guys think about that? Do you mind if I answer it from actually what we, so I suppose I manage a large technical community myself, so probably in some cases have a similar challenge, um, because obviously our technology is moving at such a pace as well in terms of innovation, so we struggle to keep up with it. Um, so if I answer it from that angle first, I think um, one of the things you've got to get right again is kind of this, this the right people that want to be self-starters and actually learn themselves and have the passion for continuous learning. And I think that does come down to the talent that you actually acquire because you can put on all the training in the world for people, um, but actually if they're not gonna go away and want to have the passion to learn and look, look online and keep up to date with things, actually you're still gonna fall behind, I think, in terms of your technical capability. So the people, a big thing that we and our customers, we support our customers with is getting the right people in that have that passion to learn and be at the forefront. In terms of, I guess, um, them self-learning, and we're also seeing that for me it's about the community and actually bringing together the technical community within the organizations. So delivering things uh, where they actually deliver brown bags to each other or maybe you have a product champ in your organization for a particular, particular technical area that would deliver that brown bag. Uh, we do a series of sort of what we call tech huddles where we bring together people and they do like TED talks, you know, 15 minutes, short, sharp. It means you create connections across the business with people that have had experiences and it allows you to then follow up and get some more learning from them. 
So I think probably what I would summarise is I don't think learning is about formalised training particularly anymore. I think it does come down to people's passion to learn and bringing together communities where they are sharing and continuously evolving together. And that's the type of culture, I think, that we're seeing our customers want to get right. And it will also help with actually retaining talent within your business if you're actually driving that, that right type of thing. And but, you now, of course, have the world's largest development community because GitHub's now yes. part of Microsoft yeah. as of last week. Right? But, you know, we, so we can deliver all the formal training. What's Microsoft's strategy for GitHub? No, I'm joking. Oh, no, um, God, no. But yeah, I mean, you know, there's formal training courses out yeah. there. We do free stuff, paid stuff, but I don't think it's about that yeah. particularly to get it right anymore. Um, and so. so we have just a couple of minutes left. Do we have one final question, and then we'll go into, like, popcorn answer mode? Any, any, any hands going up? I'll give it a three, a two, a one. Yeah. Quick question. The name of the panel is Death to Pilot. If yeah. there was one thing you could do to make sure that instead of some companies doing tens of pilots and then just one or two getting to production, to invert that so that most would get to production and a few would fail, what would be the single thing you'd do? If, um, I'm tempted actually to just point a camera somewhere at my iPad screen, which is that was literally my closing question. So you're a pro, sir. You should be on stage <laughs> next year. Um, so guys, qu question, one, one piece of advice. What would it be? How do, we, how do we solve this problem? I know this chap, so I can't answer. Plant, plant. <laughs> Um, I, I think, you know, you summarise the fact that you've got to just do it, and I think do it now. Um, I think there's, you know, take, take the moment to pause for reflection, get your ducks in a row in terms of the governance of your organisation, so set yourselves up for success with people, process, protocols, um, the landscape of what you need to know, so that kind of operating model, get it in place, take that moment to pause, and then I think you'd accelerate uh, forward much quicker by just taking that second to pause. The, the pause for distinctiveness. Um, yeah. Alice? Um, I think I'd say, um, I can hear it in my headphones as well. I think I'd say the um, same sort of thing I've been saying, you know, through this panel, which is think about it as, uh, think about it as change as change has ever been. And you need the, the most important thing is to invest in leaders or to have leaders who are aligned, who believe, who understand. Um, and you can talk, walk the talk and be courageous and, you know, and pause if they need to and fail and learn all those wonderful things. If you don't get that right, I think it's very difficult to make this kind of shift across an organization. Um, and by leaders, I would say, you know, top 200, depends how big an organization is, but quite a big number of people that you want to um, get aligned and organized. And then creating the culture around it. I mean, I think we've, we've touched on this before, but, you know, how to engage and energize large numbers of people by, we did Googler to Googler learning in the, you know, like you talked about, you know, how can you get, how could you set the thing up so it runs and, you know, so nourishes itself. Leadership, culture, and community. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Um, Mark, awesome. um, <laughs> I'd say stop going on about AI. Stop talking about remove AI machine learning from your vocabulary entirely. Like we don't talk about electricity. Like who's, I'm, I'm who's, not going to tell Tabitha that you said that. Ch <laughs> chief electricity officer in the bank is who, right? It's a, this is a general purpose technology that can be deployed across the organization. And don't have an ambition of making AI really big. Have an ambition of diffusing it. It's sort of Intel inside. It's, um, it sort of powers lots of things, but the things it powers are much more important than AI. Mm -hmm. That would be my top tip. Fantastic. Well, please join me in thanking our, our panelists, uh, Mark, Alice, and Sophie. Thank you guys very much indeed, and enjoy the rest of the show.